Well, good morning. Welcome to Cornerstones. Good to see everybody again today. Glad you, you've joined us. Welcome to those who are watching online as well. If you missed last night, you missed a really uh, cool evening here at the church. We had our fall fun day, so the kids had some, some fun and had some good activities. Then we had our chili cook-off. And so uh, you missed some good chili. We had some really, really good chili last night. Uh, had a good contest there. I think Tanya McChesney won our chili cook-off. Uh, and then we had a, a pie contest as well, uh, and uh, the Lindberg's won that. So uh, good food last night, good fellowship. And then we also shared a little bit about our new outreach building. And I uh, wanted to give you guys a quick update on that this morning before I jump into the message. And on, uh, if you notice over in the cafe, we do have some, some of the conceptual drawings from uh, the architect and some of the drawings, uh, the functional drawings from the inside and the layout that we're working on. Uh, we've been, uh, the work has already started on the inside and on the outside, so you've seen some of the grading being done. We're really excited about this building. Uh, and so this is a building that it's got multiple uses. Our youth will be meeting there. Uh, uh, not only that, um, it'll be for our community meals that we host here at the church uh, and a whole lot of other meetings uh, and events. And so when we have events here at the church, uh, we are limited by space right now. And if you've ever been to one of our meals or one of our outreach events, things like our coat giveaway, things like that, you know how packed uh, it can be. So this gives us a whole lot of opportunities to do more outreach to the community, to do more events, uh, to host things here, concerts, conferences, all sorts of things. And so you're seeing some of the the pictures on the screen now. You can see a really nice outside area with some seating areas, and uh, that's right off this parking lot and that grading. Uh, that's what that's for is that seating area right there. Uh, the main entrance is going to be on this side of the building, so it's really going to be nice. And uh, I want to take a minute to thank um, back in February – we had a group of guys and, and, and ladies start meeting together to come up with the plan for this building. We've kind of created a little subcommittee. We call it our core team here. Um, and so they've been meeting weekly since February, coming up, work meeting with contractors, planning everything, organizing everything. Um, and they've just done an incredible job. And so a uh, number of people on that, Don Smythe has kind of headed that up. Uh, we've Then we had uh, Caleb Sizemore, uh, Stacy Reedy, Greg Williams, uh, Jennifer and Bonnie have helped with the uh, some of the design stuff as well. Uh, so everything is just coming along great on it. Uh, we appreciate your support, your generosity, which has enabled us to do this. And and you can just see from right there, it's going to be. Uh, I, I think when people started seeing some of these prints and all, they they realize it's going to be nice. It's going to be something that uh, is usable. That but it's uh, it's just going to be really. Uh, it's going to be something special here that enables us to, to reach people for Jesus. So uh, we're excited about that. Check out the prints over there in the cafe. Uh, you can look at that and get some ideas on what it's going to be like. And uh, if you got any questions at all, just ask us. We'd, we'd love, uh, love to tell you about it. So uh, with that, I'm kind of going to go ahead and we get to continue our series called Flirting with Disaster. Now, the very first week of this series, Chris uh, started off, and during the message, I got a text message like, man, we need to sing a song. Travis was texting me during the message. Um, I'll tell on a little bit. And so there's a song by, I'm going I'm, I'm to get, get you to show your age a little bit here. There's a song by Molly Hatchett called Flirting with Disaster. Does anybody remember that song? Okay. Yeah, if you're under probably 40, you, you may not remember that. Um, but that song, it really does kind of fit with this series a little bit. It, it starts off, it says, I'm traveling down the road. I'm flirting with disaster. I've got the pedal to the floor. My life is running faster. I'm out of money. I'm out of hope. It looks like self-destruction. How much more can we take with all this corruption? And that song, it just kind of talks about what so many people, when we flirt with disaster, it's like we're right on that edge. We know that destruction uh, is right down the road. Uh, we know that, man, it's, that it's not good. We're out of money. We're out of hope. And, and so with this series, here's what I, I want to do. I want to give you hope, right? We don't have to live there any longer. 
We don't have to live as slaves to sin anymore. And this series really is about overcoming sin. It's about finding those strongholds in our life that are holding us back, and let's break free from those. Let's learn um, how we can overcome those things. This week, well, we get to talk about how we flirt with disaster, and we get to tackle a pretty hard subject. I'm just going to be honest with you. Uh, it's hard because it's uncomfortable to talk about. It's hard because there's so many people that struggle with it. And it's hard because our, our society doesn't really view it as a problem. It almost promotes it as a virtue in some ways. And, and so today we're going to be talking about the issue of overcoming lust. Now, I'm going to tell you up front, I'm going to try to keep it as PG as possible. But uh, when you talk about lust, there are certain things that, that will come up. Um, as we talk about that and, and, and pornography a little bit too today. Um, this morning, uh, man, this is just, it is so important we talk about this because statistics will tell us that, uh, that so many people struggle with, uh, with lust problems, right? With pornography, pornography problems and, and, and adultery. And, and I know that it affects so many people that there are people in this room today, uh, just statist statistically speaking, I know that are struggling with it. So this is one of those things that we can't avoid. We need to talk about things uh, that people are going through. Now, the statistics on lust are overwhelming. Um, I couldn't find like the current statistics. The ones I found were, were, you know, eight to 10 years old. And since then, I know it's grown even more. But pornography is still the driving force of the Internet. When you look at, at what goes on, the revenue it generates, uh, it's higher than all the network TV channels combined. And just think about that for a minute, how how big that is and how pro how much of a problem that is. It's an entire industry that's driven by lust and it's and the pornography industry is driving the sex trafficking industry. And so those two things are interrelated and connected and and, and we've got to realize how big of of a problem this is this is and and yet so many people will tell you but what I do in the privacy of my own home it doesn't hurt anybody. It doesn't affect anybody. And I want you to know this morning that there's nothing that could be further from the truth. It does impact you. It affects those around you. It affects your relationship with God. It affects uh, the people that have been uh, caught up in the whole sex trafficking industry. It hurts young women and young men, it, and it traps you and destroys your connection with the, those that are closest to you, and it affects your relationship to God. And so this is why we've got to be willing to dig in deep. It, it affects young and old. It affects both male and female. And it affects both single and married people. Now, when we talk about lust, there's pornography, there's fantasy, there's just flirtation, there's sexting, romance novels, inappropriate movies and music. And man, I could go on and on. And all of them are damaging. And all of them have really devastating consequences. And we haven't yet even mentioned what happens when you give way to, you know, you kind of take that next step past the thoughts and the fantasies and put those into action. And so this morning, again, this is so important that we talk about it. Uh, last week, I brought up the whole idea of the seven deadly sins that uh, that throughout history have been kind of promoted and shown these have really serious consequences in your life. And we talked about anger last week. But when we talk about anger, we talk about envy or pride or greed or slothfulness or uh, some of those. It's like almost with those where you think, oh, well, we can control those and everybody deals with them. But when it gets to lust, it's like this shameful thing that nobody admits that they struggle with. You know, when we get to lust, it's one of those things that we sweep under the rug a little bit and we don't even let people know that it's an issue. And so we're filled with remorse. We're filled with shame if you struggle with it. And you worry about where it will lead if you let it get out of control. And then on top of that, we're faced every day with billboards and movies and music and newspapers and magazines that just continually give us those lustful images because sex sells. 
And, and so how do we as believers stand up and live a holy and righteous and pure life in the midst of a society where that's, not an, that's just not a, an important virtue that, that, that is played out on the screens before us every day? Uh, John said it this way in 1 John uh, chapter 2. This is where I want to start in the, in, in the Bible this morning. He says, do not love the world nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. For the world offers only a craving for physical, physical pleasure. Uh, the lust of the flesh is what it's uh, translated as in other versions. A craving for everything we see, a lust of the eyes and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from this world. And this world is fading away along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. And so John kind of understands this world is throwing all this at us constantly. The lust for what we want, for what we think we need, and, and, and the physical pleasures but then the lust of what our eyes see and are constantly looking at and saying, I, I need this, I want this, and, and that lust that we have. That's what the world is throwing at us, and John's telling us those aren't, those aren't coming from God. We've got to understand that we're in a battle, and it's not just a battle for the adults in this room. This is a battle for our children. It's a battle for our grandchildren, and that's why we've got to know how we can stand strong against this. So let's, if we're in a battle, so where, where do we start? Let's start by understanding what lust really is. If you're following along in your notes, here's the first thing. Lust, it's simply passion gone wrong. I think that's a, a good way to look at this and to help us understand it's a passion that has gone wrong. Uh, for most people, when we think about lust, we think about the sexual desires and in Scripture, in many cases, there is this uh, illicit sexual desire. Uh, there's a connotation of sexual immorality when we talk about lust. So our temptation is, okay, we hear this, and, and if you don't struggle with that, you just check out. Well, lust is more than that. And, and so let's kind of break it down. In the New Testament, the word, word that's most frequently translated lust, it simply means a strong desire or passion. Um, and so this, this, this word can even be used to describe a legitimate godly desire. And so when Jesus said to his, disciple, to his disciples, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. It's the same word. I've eagerly desired. Uh, when Paul told the Philippian believers that he strongly desired to depart this life, to be with the Lord, it's the same word. And so it's this strong desire. So uh, strong desire can be either a good thing or a bad thing, depending upon the object of the desire and the motivation behind it. And so to understand lust, we've got to dig a little deeper because it's a passion. It's a strong desire, but it's a strong desire that has gone wrong. That is turned away from a, a godly use into a use that, uh, it's about self-gratification. And so uh, when we look at that, uh, we, what we need to understand is God created the human heart with a capacity for passionate, for passionate desire. Why did he do that? Because we need to long after God and desire God in that way. We need to have a, a strong desire and passion to, to honor God and to serve God and to love God. And what happens is that 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 passion, that that emotion that God gave us, we have turned it, and instead of using it for God's glory, we've used it for our glory. And that's when it's gone wrong. That's when it turns from a godly desire to a lustful desire. And so when we hear that, uh, we know. Um, and we understand this is, we just have that connotation for lust that it's, uh, that it, it, it's bad. It's not something we need to be caught up in. And that's really nothing new. Uh, Paul, when he was writing to the, the, the church at Thessalonica, uh, and he, he actually said this in chapter 4. Uh, this is how Paul phrased it. He said, it is God's will that you should be sanctified. 
that you should avoid sexual immorality. And, and if we've studied that in the past, if you know that, that word sexual immorality, it's all sexual activity outside of marriage, uh, that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the pagans. So there we see the contrast, right? It, it, it's self-control. It's, a, it's controlling those desires in a way that's holy and honorable versus a passionate lust like people who don't even know God. And that in this matter, no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or a, or a sister. The Lord will punish all those who commit such sins as we told you and warned you before. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. And so therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human, a human being, but they reject God, the very God who gives you his Holy Spirit. And so I would tell you this morning, if you start pushing back and saying, but I can do what I want, then you're not upset at what I'm saying. You're upset at God who came up with the divine order of this world we live in. And so we need to understand that, that, that God called us, right, to a, especially as believers, he's called us to be holy, to be set apart, to be different, to not live like the culture around us, but to be an example to the culture around us on what it means to live a holy, an honorable life. And it's not an impure life. It's not a life filled with lust. It's a life, right, filled with godly desire. And so how do we know then Let's kind of take it one step further. How do we know then when a desire has gone wrong? Well, if you're following along in your notes, it, says, it has this. It says, when a desire is either out of bounds or out of balance, it becomes hurtful, it can become destructive, and it become, become, become sinful. And so this is kind of how we, we understand when a, the desire has gone wrong and, and a way for us to kind of process this. If something is out of bounds or out of balance, that's when it becomes lustful and um, that's when it becomes dangerous. If you look up the word lust in a dictionary, it says this, a strong sexual desire or a passionate desire for something, a sensuous appetite regarded as sinful. So even in the dictionary, there's this, uh, there's this understanding that there's something that's out of bounds. There's something that is sinful. And when that grabs hold of us, when that entices us, when that grabs us, then we know that it, becomes, it moves from a, a healthy desire to a lustful uh, passion here. And so having desires is not bad. That, that's, natural. that's a natural part of being a human. A sexual desire in the context of marriage is a very good thing. But outside of marriage, it is a very dangerous thing. And, and so we know there's things that are inbounds and out of bounds. Um, in, in sports, it's kind of interesting, right? If you watch football or, or, or basketball, there are, there are boundary lines. There are uh, the lines that are out of bounds. And as long as you're on uh, this side, you're inbounds. But when you cross that line, you go out of bounds, right? And, and, that's, uh, the, and Chris talked about that the first week of this series. And we need God has established those boundaries in our life. Now, uh, you, now the, the, the trouble is so many people, we walk right along that, that line where it just takes one little shove to fall over that line. We need to stay as close to Jesus as we can. And, 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 and if we want to, to live a, a holy, a pure life, and that's, who, that's our goal is not how close we can get to sin, but how close we can stay to Jesus. All right. But those lines, when we cross those lines, we know we've gone out of bounds. And so, uh, for example, right, um, here's some, some examples of when things are inbounds or out of bounds. If you have a passionate sexual desire for a spouse, that's inbounds. We know that God instituted marriage. He said a husband and wife will become one flesh. That is a good thing. But outside of marriage, that is out of bounds because it doesn't line up with God's design, with God's will. That's not what he created it. Four. And when our thoughts and our 
you know, our, our fantasies, we start thinking about other people and imagine it. That's when we've, we've, again, we've crossed over from, from what God designed and what God intended and we've become out of balance and we've just started thinking about ourselves. And, and so again, this is just a way to kind of understand um, what is inbounds and inbounds, but how do we do that? Well, it's based not on what we feel, but on what God says. And I think in our culture today, everybody likes to base uh, moral uh, truth based on what we feel. Well, I think this should be right. We really love each other, so what, what does it matter? Or we're going to get married one day anyway, so why can't we just go ahead? And it's that type of thinking that, that leads us to cross the God-given boundaries because we just make excuses. We rationalize things. It's not based on what we think or what we feel. It's based on what God says and how God designed this world that we live in. He did that not to take the joy out of our life, but to protect us and to, to help us flourish in a way that he created us. And, and so lust is this desire that's unleashed and uncontrolled because it consumes us because we're thinking about self-gratification. Now, it, it's not just sexual desire, though, as we've talked about. This world kind of throws at us. There's power. There's popularity. There's prosperity. There's all these lists I could go on and on and talk about, right, of things that, that Satan kind of puts out in front of us and says, you need this, you, you, you want this, and, and your life won't be complete if you don't have this. And so we start lusting after those things. And so we've got to understand that's just another way Satan tries to entice us to, to cross those boundary lines in life. And so it's this passionate, this, this when, when lust, it's this desire that's gone wrong, a passion that's gone wrong, where we've turned our eyes away from God and what he's commanded us, and we've really just said, I'm going to do whatever I want to do. Um, we see this in the Bible. We see many of examples of this happen, and, and whether it's in the Old Testament and, and the book of Judges where it talks about every person did what was right in their own eyes, uh, just did whatever they wanted, whatever they thought. Uh, we see this in the book of Romans in chapter 1. Uh, there's a couple of verses here that really, I think, really do a good job of explaining, I think, even where we're at today in a culture. Uh, in Romans 1, verse 24 and verse 25, it says that God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desired. As a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. They traded the truth about God for a lie. So they worshiped and served the things God created instead of the creator himself. And I think that's really, uh, and it's, yeah, it keeps going, who's worthy of eternal praise. I think that's kind of, where we're at as a culture today. Um, people aren't concerned about the creator God. They're, they're concerned about created things. And in Romans, we see how that led to rampant sexual immorality and homosexuality. And we see how people were just focused on pleasing themselves and they didn't care about God. And, and so it was a culture that was very serious or very similar to ours today. And they rejected God's design for something good. And they turned it into an unrestrained passion for something that was out of bounds. And so we see there, uh, we see this is kind of how, uh, how, uh, how we know what's right and what's not. It's not based on what we think or feel. It's based on what God says. But how does lust really start? How do we give in to that temptation? How do we find ourselves in a place that we don't want to be? Well, I, I would say that we've got to understand how lust begins. And, and lust, it begins with a look. That's your next point in your outline. Lust begins with a look. Begins with a look. Now, you may think, well, but doesn't it begin in the heart? Well, I'm going to back it up, and I'm going to say, let's understand kind of what happens, right? Because sometimes we just notice something, we look at something, and our, it's it just like all of a sudden, we're, you know, our mind goes somewhere we don't want it to go. Um, impurity, really, it begins in the eye. The world tells us 
that we can look as long as we don't touch. Have you heard that before? You can look, just don't touch. Well, let me ask you, how's that working out for people in our society today? It's not, not working out good at all, right? You can look, but you can't touch. Now, now really, because when Jesus talked about it, he, he kind of had a different perspective on that, didn't he? You, you see, when we look and, and allow our minds to go where to cross those boundaries that God has established, when we start fantasizing, when we start dreaming, when we start desiring things that 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 are outside of God's plan, then then what happens? Well, we start twisting something God created as good. And we start allowing ourselves, right, uh, to get consumed with lust and desire. Psalm 101 verse 3 says this. It's, uh, the psalmist said, I'm not going to look at uh, with approval on anything that is vile. In other words, he, he understands that the eyes, right, the eyes are important. What we look at. Psalm, uh, Proverbs 27, 20. Uh, it says, just as death and destruction are never satisfied, so human desire is never satisfied. Um, some versions in that second part will say, instead of human desire, they'll say, neither are human eyes. Human desire, or human eyes. There's a link between our eyes and the desires that we have. And so we've got to be careful what we look at. Because this whole idea of we can look, but we can't touch, that doesn't work. That, that doesn't work in, in real life. Um, think about David and Bathsheba, right? Uh, the story in the Old Testament, if you want to read it this week, you, you can go there and read it. But what happened with David? One, he should have been at war, but he stayed back. He was on his roof. He was looking. He saw Bathsheba ba bathing, right? Now, when he looked at her, I don't think he just said, oh, there's somebody over there. And, and did he turn her away? No, he looked, right? He looked. If he had binoculars, he went and got them. I mean, that's kind of what we see here with David. He took interest in this. So he was, he was zeroed in. He was looking, but he didn't even stop there. That was, the, that was the trigger. That was the gateway that opened up the door. When he was standing there, he didn't go, you know, if I look over here at Bathsheba, I, I think I, I, I want to go murder her husband. No, he didn't. That's not what lust does. It says, ooh, I wonder what would happen. I wonder, and he let his mind start taking in places. Well, who is it? What's her name? Uh, what? Let, let, can I meet her? Uh, let's bring her here and let me meet her. And then one thing led to another. Then it led him to uh, trying to cover up his sin with Bathsheba. Then it led him to, to lying about it, right? Then it led him... Um, to trying to, to cover it up by, by framing or bringing her husband back and making it look like it was him. And then when nothing else worked and when he was caught in this web of lies and this trap, he arranged for her husband to be killed in battle. And so what you see is that one little look led to all these other sins because he, he just he, ref, he gave in to that temptation. He looked. And he kept looking. There's going to be times you notice things in life. And it's in those times you have to make a decision. Am I going to just glance and then turn away? Or am I going to look? And am I going to keep looking? I'm just telling you, as part of this world we live in today, you're going to see things that tempt you. If you're on the internet, there's going to be ads that pop up and you have to say, I'm not going to look. There's going to be times that you see a billboard or you see a magazine or you see an ad or you see something pop up on TV. You've got to decide in those moments, I'm not going to look because lust begins with a look. And, and so this is, this is really what Jesus was talking about in Matthew 5 when he was giving the, the Sermon on the Mount, uh, a very familiar passage. Um, he said, he told him, you've heard what the commandments say, that you must not commit adultery. It's in verse 27. You must not commit adultery. But I say, anyone who even looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. 
So he's going back to Old Testament. You know that the action is a sin, but do you now know that the thought is also a sin? And so how do you stop it? He goes and says, so if your eye, even your good eye, causes you to lust, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your hand, even your stronger hand, causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. So what is Jesus telling us here? Is he telling us to literally start plucking out our eyes? I think what he's telling us, right, is that we've got to do everything possible to deal with the sin. Here's what he doesn't say. He, say, he doesn't say, guys, I'm going to speak to the men for a minute. He, he doesn't say, guys, if you see someone, if you see a, a woman that causes you to lust, go and tell her to put more clothes on. Cover up. Now, um, modesty is a whole different message for another time. But here's what he says. Guys, if you see that, you've got to deal with your uh, your feelings, your desires. You've got to take responsibility for it. You've got to do whatever you can to nip it in the bud, to cut off that 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 feeling, right? That 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 thought, that, that whatever it is. You've got to do whatever you can to turn away and not get caught up in a lustful thought or a desire. And so here's what we do: that we blame everybody else for our own sinful desires instead of taking responsibilities for them and doing something about it. The first, I'm, I'm going to tell you this, this is, this is, this is earth shaking here. It's a groundbreaking uh, way to, to com combat lust. If you don't look, you're not going to lust. Right? I, I mean, that's, that's, and it sounds simple, but that's where it starts. Because when we step in and we start looking at something we know we shouldn't be looking at and we keep looking and we keep thinking, we find ourselves drawn uh, in doing things that, that we know we shouldn't do. We become enslaved to our sin. Paul in 2 Timothy, this is what he said. He says, you, you don't just like turn away. You run from anything that stimulates youthful lust. So instead, here's what you do. You pursue righteous living. You pursue faithfulness. You pursue love and peace. And not only that, you enjoy the companionship of those who call on the Lord with pure hearts. In other words, you surround yourself, right, with something that is better. You surround yourself with people who are holy and who are encouraging and who will help you uh, in your struggle with temptation. Uh, you, you focus on things instead of uh, evil and lustful. You, you focus on things that are holy and righteous and faithful and loving and peaceful. This is, this is how, how, how you do it. And if you're here this morning and you, and you say, I just can't help but look. I can't control myself. Okay, I'll call your bluff on that. Because I don't think what you really have is a problem with willpower. I think you have a problem of priorities. Let me explain. It, 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 and this is kind of a, a drastic example. But if someone would have put a gun to your head and say, okay, here's the deal. If you look over, you look at that person over there, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull the trigger. I, I, here's what I know. You're not going to look that way. <laughs> because you know there are consequences. You know, there are serious consequences. You're going to say, okay, I've got the willpower now because I know what will happen if I do. Our problem is we don't think about the consequences. And so when you understand there are serious consequences, and that's our next point, right? That lust can have devastating consequences. Lust can have devastating consequences. When we understand that, that lust has devastating consequences, when we understand that, it really, it really kind of changes our motivation to do what is right. It changes our priorities, right? Here's what we, we've got to understand. Throughout history, lust has been with mankind. You can go all the way back to the creation story. Adam and Eve in the garden, God met their every need. He gave them food. He gave them companionship. He gave them protection. But he put one thing out of reach for them, 
uh, and it was to test their love for him, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And what happened is due to lust, they failed God's test. Satan tempted Eve by telling her that God was holding something back. And so she and Adam, through lust, they ate the forbidden fruit, and they, uh, because of that, they subjected mankind to the curse of sin that we carry with us today. And so as we look at this, it just makes you realize that sin has devastating consequences. It's an old saying. I've heard it over and over again throughout the years. Uh, I don't know who, who it's original with because I've heard it so many times. But it's just simply this. Sin will take you farther than you want to go. It will keep you longer than you want to stay. And it will cost you more than you want to pay. That's what sin does. It never. We never start out thinking, oh, man, this is where I'm going to end up. But sin, it does that. It takes us where we don't want to go. James talks about the progression that happens when it comes to lust and when it comes to sin. In James chapter 1, it says, Temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. Then these desires, they give birth to sinful actions. And when sin is allowed uh, to grow, it gives birth to death. So you look at this verse, the, the, the terminology here that entices us, uh, in the Greek, it's this almost, it's a bait, like a fish, or like a fisherman would use. It's a bait that we see and it's tempting. We want to grab hold of it. And so we get it. And when we do, Satan sets that hook and he starts reeling us in and it drags us away. That's what happens when we look <laughs> Right? When we give in to that, that lustful thought, that lustful desire, we start fantasizing about what could be or what might be. Or, or we pick up that, that pornographic magazine or look at that pornographic image on the screen. Satan is setting that tempt. He's tempting us. He's enticing us. He sets that hook, and now he just starts reeling us in. And he says these desires eventually may not be at first, but eventually it's going to lead to a sinful action. And when you flirt with someone at work and you think, well, this is just innocent. We're just having fun. It's like he's hooked you. He's starting to reel you in. What's next? What's next? And when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. The death of dreams, the death of relationships. It could even lead to your death. And so this is why I think we've got to understand there are devastating consequences to our sin. We've got to be careful. If you've ever heard the saying, oh, he fell hook, line, and sinker for that, this is what I'm talking about, right? That's what Satan wants us to do. He wants us to fall hard for it. And so what Jesus does, he makes it clear that, that lust is a sin, even if we don't physically act upon it. Even if we just look, we've got to stop it there. Paul says we take every thought and, and make it captive to Christ. That, that's the type of, of, of what we've got. That's the way we handle it. And man, uh, I could keep going. Proverbs 7 in the Old Testament. There's this story of what happens when a, a young man is tempted by a prostitute. Right? And, Proverbs, and it says this, it says, with much seductive speech. She persuades him with her smooth talk. She compels him all at once. He follows her as an ox goes to a slaughter. Okay. I'm not going to do what that Chris did the other day. Did, did he wake you up a couple of weeks ago? That was funny. Um, as an ox goes to the slaughter or as a stag is caught fast till an arrow pierces its liver or as a, as a bird rushes into a snare, he does not know that it will cost him his life. Okay, we don't, we don't understand the consequences of our sin, the consequences of our desires. We don't know where it's leading us. And I, I guarantee that there's so many people in this world, they don't understand where their sin is going to take them or where it has taken them. They don't start off thinking, oh, I'm just having a little desire here and a little fun. They don't realize that it's what it cost them. And... and, and Here's what it will cost you. It will cost you your family. It will affect your relationship with God. It will affect your relationship with other people. It will affect your future. 
Because sin always has consequences. Um, I ask people all the time in, in, in relationships and, uh, you know, do you want God to bless your relationship? If you're dating, you're right. Uh, if you're, uh, if you're, you know, if you're engaged, if you're dating, you want God to bless your relationship. If the answer is yes, then you need to live your life in a way that honors God. He's not going to bless disobedience to his word. And so we've got to understand that the impurity, that lust, it has consequences to us. But if we just stop there, it would be kind of depressing this morning. Here's, here's the final point that I, I want to make this morning as we, as we start wrapping up. It's simply this, that God, he will give you the victory to overcome lust. That we, just because you've experienced it in the past, just because you are struggling with it now, you don't have to stay there any longer. Uh, James 4, 7 says this. It says, uh, humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. I, I'm, I'm so thankful we serve a God that says, okay, if we resist the devil, man, I'm going to give you victory. Uh, there was a Catholic priest uh, I was born in 1225, Thomas Aquinas, uh, that he wrote on how to overcome lust. And it's amazing that what he wrote uh, was that 800 years ago still applies today. This is what he said. He gave us four steps, four steps. He said, first thing, we've got to flee the external things that lead us to sin. And we've already talked about that, having boundaries, the watching who we hang out with, what we watch, what we listen to. These are the, the triggers, so to speak, that, that lead us into sin. The second thing he talked about is we've got to avoid the internal reactions and thoughts that lead us to sin. So not just the external, but what's going on inside of us that, that kind of that turns us, right, to lust. Uh, I think a lot of people uh, use that as a coping mechanism to cover up something else that's deeper going on inside. The third thing he says is we've got to pray. We've got to pray. Uh, this is not something you're going to overcome in your own strength. You need God's help. And so you need to tap into God's power source. And you do that through prayer. And then the fourth thing he said is we need to engage in wholesome activities. <laughs> There's truth there, though, right? As long as our mind is focused on things that are good and positive and holy and, and right and just, our mind's not going to take us right over into these temptations. We've got to replace uh, those temptations with something better, with something better. Um, I love what Romans 8 says. Um, it says in verse 12 and 13, Dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. For if you live by its dictates, you will die. But if through the power of the Spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. That's pretty, pretty plain, right? It's what we've, there's a battle going on. We need the Spirit's help to, to stand up. And we, we're not under any obligation to do uh, what Satan wants us to do, the sinful nature. We can stand up. We can, we, can, we can stand strong in the face of temptation. The, the Bible says with every temptation, right, there's a way of escape. Every temptation, there's a way of escape. Every temptation that Satan throws our way, God gives us a door uh, that we can get out and, uh, and, and not give in. And so just understanding that, right, it's by the power of the Spirit and by the power of the Spirit, here's what we've got to do. We've got to bring the sin to light. So if you're here today and you're struggling with something, the first step is to admit it, uh, to bring it to light. Um, open up, admit you have a problem to get help. We'll help you. We'll walk with you. We're not going to condemn you or, or judge you. We're going we're to help you find victory over that sin in your life. This is for men and women. We've got people here that have gone through it that are willing to sit with you and, and help you and understand what accountability looks like and help you understand how you can have victory over this sin in your life. There are so many resources online. Uh, we talk a lot about Right Now Media. 
which is our kind of our video Bible study library. There are lots and lots of studies on there about lust and about impurity and about sexual addiction and all those things like that that will help you find freedom. Uh, there's websites, uh, uh, Triple X Church is one that's been been going on for years now that are helping people find freedom from addictions. There's internet filtering. We can help you understand how that's set up. There's all these, but here's what we want you to know. You don't have to be a slave to your sin. Uh, I, I love uh, Ephesians 2, um, verse 4 through 10 kind of gives us hope. God is so rich in mercy. He loves us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It's only by God's grace you've been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ. He seated us with him in the heavenly realms uh, because we are united with Christ Jesus. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. God saved you by his grace when you believed, and you can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things that he's planned for us long ago. Here's what I want you to know. The first step to overcoming sin is making sure Jesus is the Lord of your life. And when you make him the Lord of your life, when you put your faith and trust in Jesus, he's going to give you a new heart. He will replace those old desires with new desires as we grow closer to him. And then we can do the good things that he's planned for us. I'm going to pray now and I'm going to invite you uh, to follow Jesus. Let's pray to together. Heavenly Father, it's so tough to talk about issues that are little that make us uncomfortable. But I'm so thankful your word addresses things in our life that do make us uncomfortable because it makes us examine ourselves and examine our motives, examine our desires and where we fall short, Lord. I pray that we would confess our sin and repent and we would turn back to you. Lord, I pray this morning for each person here that they would know that they could have victory over any sin in their life, not just lust, but any sin they're facing, they can find freedom. And that freedom is through Jesus Christ. And so if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus, that's your first step. Your first step is trusting him. It's handing control of your life to Jesus and saying, "I, I can't do this on my own any longer. I need you. It's confessing our sin. It's confessing our need for God. It's confessing that Jesus is now Lord of our life. And it's also believing that Jesus is really who he says he is, that he came and he died for us on the cross, that he paid the penalty just for us so that we could have freedom, that we could have victory over sin in our life. And so if you're here this morning, while everybody's praying, I want to invite you to make Jesus the Lord of your life if you've never done that. If you don't know Jesus, would you pray with me today and just say, Dear Heavenly Father, I confess my need for you. I know I've disobeyed. I know I've messed up time after time. But yet here I am today, Lord, and I want to give you control of my life. I want to surrender to you. I want to submit to you. I want to make you Lord and Master. And Jesus, I believe. I believe you died for me. I believe you died on the cross so that I could have life, an eternal life. And I believe you rose from the grave, Lord, to give me victory over sin and death. And Lord, just help me to follow you. Help me to stand strong against the temptation in my life. And Lord, I'll walk with you by the Spirit's help. Here's what I want you to know this morning. Every head's bowed. If you prayed that prayer, Jesus heard it and he answered it. Romans 10, 13 says, all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And so I'm so thankful we have a God that hears us. We have a God that saves us. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning. And we praise Jesus for all that he's done in this place, all that he's doing in our life and in our hearts. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. So as we close today, this is our chance to to respond to what we've heard. And and for maybe there's something that you need to bring out to the light. And if you want to take a communication card and write it out and drop it in the box, we'll be praying for you this week. 
If you want to come and write out a prayer request over here at the cross, you can do that. If you want to come up and receive communion, it's a chance for believers uh, to remember what Jesus has done for them. You can do that. Or if you want to talk or you want to pray with one of us, we'll be in the back and I would love to meet with you and talk with you. Uh, Otherwise, just stay right where you are and praise God today. Let's stand and let's close together.